Okay, so today we are going to talk about the French Revolution. We're only focusing on section one at this time. So we're looking at the causes, the events that led up to the French Revolution, and then the French Revolution beginning. So the first thing we're going to take a peek at here is the Palace of Versailles. Now, this palace was created by Louis XIV. So this was a little while ago. Um, but unfortunately for Louis the 16th, he's going to have to pay the price for it. So when we look at the Palace of Versailles, if you would look at the cost, the estimated costs, let's say back in 2003, because that's what our textbook is showing here, uh, it was estimated at $2.5 billion to make, that it had 36,000 laborers and 6,000 horses to work on the project. Now, for Louis the 14th, he was known as the Sun King. He was the model of absolutism throughout Europe. He was what everyone else wanted to be like. Uh, well, I should say monarchs. The nobles, yeah, they really would like to have brought him down a notch or two. And when you look here at his Palace of Versailles, here you have his Hall of Mirrors. And in the Hall of Mirrors, uh, you have 17 tall mirrors on one side, and on the opposite side, you have 17 windows. And those windows open up into the gardens, and his gardens are huge. And you have the gilded statues, you have crystal chandeliers, you have paintings, even up here on the ceiling. I mean, this man has so much gold put into this palace that it was just oozing with it. But he wanted to show how powerful and wealthy France was, and that he the king, an absolute king, this is how you lived. It was like MTV, MTV when they played music. They also had MTV cribs. And this would be like, come in here and check out my crib and look at all of this stuff that I have. His gardens, and this is just one little section of his gardens. And you also have the fountains over here. But in his gardens, 5,000 acres of gardens, lawns, and woods, 1,400 fountains, and he loved to walk through the gardens, and he wanted, like, his fountains would spit out water as he would go by. Well, it cost way too much, <laughs> and it was too much effort to actually get water to constantly be produced, so people had to, like, walk in front of him in order to make sure that the fountains were flowing once he got there. And years later, when Louis the Fourteenth was elderly and he had to be in what would have been their version of a wheelchair, they discovered that he also had like wheelchair ramps put into the garden so he could go out there and see that. But the people who had to build this palace, and it started off as just a hunting lodge outside of Paris, because not only was he building this elaborate palace to represent his monarchy, but it was also a way to pull the government out of Paris and into Versailles, where the king now controlled the government and he pulled it away from the influence of the nobles. Well, this is continuing through Louis the 15th, and now we're in Louis the 16th. And Louis the 16th is the one who's taking us into this um, French Revolution. Now, this costs a lot of money to build this Versailles and to maintain this lavish lifestyle. But on top of this luxurious lifestyle, you also had a nation that was in constantly going to war. And war costs money. So let's talk about those causes of the French Revolution. We know the Enlightenment, you know, France was the heart of the Enlightenment and all the salons in Paris. Well, the Enlightenment ideas of power to the people, power of the people was very influential to the French people in these three estates. You have this idea that they could participate, whether it's through voting or holding a government office. The idea of switching from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional one that provided law to limit what the king could do. This idea that we could have freedom, we could have liberty, we could have equality. These are things that the people were wanting they wanted Voltaire's idea of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to petition your king, your monarch, regarding your grievances. So these ideas were greatly influencing a nice chunk of the people here in France. 
you also have the idea that the enlightened despots, that the enlightened <clears throat> leaders were going to make changes. And Louis XVI kind of set himself up. He wanted to be considered an enlightened despot, an enlightened absolute monarch, just like his brother-in-law, Joseph II of Austria. Well, okay, you get the title, but you actually have to make reforms, and he fails to do so. He fails to satisfy the social classes because there are no reforms based on the enlightenment that they could embrace and start to see change. You know, he actually helped the American colonists in the front in the American Revolution. They thought this would tie back into France and he would start to make these adjustments. He didn't. He's got something else to deal with and it's not the people's problems. You know, on Wednesday and also with the other classes on Thursday and Friday, we went over the old regime, those three estates. So it's not difficult for us to understand that people are upset. They are dissatisfied with that old regime. I mean, we have here this political cartoon. You have that third estate right here on the bottom. That third estate is pretty much carrying everyone in France on their back. They're doing all the work. They're paying all the taxes. When are the other people, when are the other estates going to have to, you know, join in? When are they going to do their part? And when's the king going to step up and force them to do so? There's no social mobility in these estates. You're born into this peasantry, into the working class. You're really not moving out of that category. You're stuck in that third estate, and that third estate holds no political power. High taxation, that also covers in that old regime, that high taxation of the poor. The third estate carries the heaviest tax burden, and when you look within the third estate, it's the poorest people in that group, the peasants, who have to pay the heaviest. So you have the high taxation of the poor is used to support the luxurious lifestyle of France at the Palace of Versailles, the upper clergy, and all of these wars. Well, there's only so much money you're going to pretty much pull out of the poor people. It's not there. You need to start looking elsewhere. When is the government going to do that? When are they going to look elsewhere? And we're starting to see the social unrest. Where is the equality? There's vast inequality in the makeup of the three estates. Again, no social mobility. You have two estates who hold political power, and they have pretty much made sure that it's a family affair. You have nobles who are making sure that they have sons in the place in the first estate. So when any decision needs to be made and those representatives need to come in, they're going to make it, and they're going to exclude that third estate every single time. And those first two estates are going to work together to try to take power from the king and not share that with anyone else. So we are seeing inequality between taxes, between the political power, between social injustices. People are wanting change. And that third estate is getting very restless. War debts. My goodness, the war debts that this country has accumulated, starting back with Louis XIV. He loved wars. He wanted to build a French empire. Sometimes he was successful and sometimes he wasn't. And through those wars, it costs money and they have to take out loans. Well, Louis XV will continue. And now Louis XVI took them into the American Revolution. And they also have some issues down in Mexico. This debt keeps building and building and building. They are on the verge of a financial collapse. The banks, the national banks, the world banks, the family bankers, for the monarchies, for these countries, are now saying, we will give you no more money. You haven't even started to pay on the interest of your loans. It's due. So France now needs to figure out, or I should say Louis XVI needs to figure out, how am I going to pay off this war debt? How am I going to handle this? How am I going to tell my people, my estates general, that we are on the verge of a financial collapse? if we don't start to take care of this war debt. And then we end up with, you know, and you can't control Mother Nature at all. Mother Nature decides to work with you. Wonderful. She decides to destroy you. Your, car, your har uh, harvest is destroyed. Your crops are destroyed. And unfortunately, that's what France is running into at this time. 
They have bad weather. It destroyed the crops. They have poor harvest. Prices on the foods going to skyrocket, which unfortunately for that third estate, this is going to be rough. How are you going to afford these things? You have flour. Now the price of three months wages in order to buy a little bit of flour. You have prices on bread going through the roof and the taxes are out of this world. So that third estate is struggling and particularly that working and working class and the peasants, they're struggling very hard. The first two estates are fine. But the majority of the population, they're hit the hardest, and we're looking at a famine. When's the government going to step in and deal with this issue? Louis XVI is not going to deal with this issue. He has to deal with his war debt. That's his financial crisis, not what's covering with his people. And so that takes us to this last bullet point here. The government has isolated itself. They're not looking at the problems of the poor. Louis is, not, Louis is just clueless. He is the most incompetent ruler out there. He is a very weak leader, and the nobles and the clergy know that, and they're going to use that to their advantage. They're also going to use the, to their advantage his wife, Marie Antoinette. She's been an outsider. The French people, since Cardinal Richelieu and Louis XIII, have pretty much been taught to hate the Austrian Habsburgs, and that's where she comes from. She's been trying to fit in, and she's trying to find a place for herself in France. She loves to gamble. She loves to play cards, and she's not very good at it. So Louis has those debts to take care of, too, because she's playing the card games with the nobles, and they want their money back. And they know that they can get her on their side, and they can use that to manipulate Louis the Sixteenth. So the government isn't doing anything to help the people. And the people are going to demand change. So the rest of our slides here are going to break down between all of these events that lead up to the revolution. Calling of the Estates General. Why is he calling them? What happens at the meeting of the Estates General? The tennis court oath. We're going to form the National Assembly and finally get it recognized. Storming of the Bastille. And then we're going to end with the great fear. So let's look at calling of the Estates General because Louis XVI thinks, I've got the upper hand. I'm going to force these nobles to do what I want. And their response is, please call them because we have a little something for you too. So King Louis XVI calls a meeting of the Estates General. But why is he calling them? Well, that war debt. <laughs> the financial crisis that is looming and pretty much this is a nation on the verge of bankruptcy and he's been trying he has gone through multiple financial ministers trying to figure out ways in order to collect money <clears throat> he understands that you cannot continue to tax the poorest people of the land that you're going to have to <clears throat> excuse me you're going to have to start to pull money from your wealthy and the group that he would like to get money from will be the second estate, the nobles. He is not going to touch the church, not one bit. The church, he's not going that way. He is a devout Catholic. He's not approaching them. But instead of telling the people what the problem is, uh, he goes back and forth between the local governing bodies known as parliaments. And unfortunately for him, it's the nobles who control the local little governments, the parliaments. So he says, I'm going to call the meeting of the estates general. And that means each estate is going to have to send delegates. And we're going to try to work this thing out. And so he tells each estate that they can prepare a list of grievances to bring before the king and the estates general. And they can share the things that they would like the king to address and to fix. He has no intention of listening to their list of grievances. He just needs to get the delegates there so then he can reveal his big secret. We have a huge debt and you guys need to figure out how we're going to pay for it. So you have the nobles coming up with their list. You have the clergy coming up with theirs. And the third estate, the bourgeoisie, that middle class creates a list. The working class creates a list, and the peasants create a list. In that third estate, all of those items will be given to the middle class, 
the delegates for the third estate to take to the estates general. What the king hopes to achieve here, he wants the estates general to tax the second estate. That's the group he wants to start to get money out of to start to pay off his huge debt, the huge war debt that France has been accumulating over three different monarchs. But we have a problem. Before we can even get delegates into the meeting, how many representatives are each state going to have? Because this is a dispute. You know, the third estate makes up the majority of the population. So the third estate is demanding that they should have more delegates. They need to more have more representatives. The first and second estate are saying, absolutely not. It should be equal. Each estate should have the same amount. So let's say 300 apiece. And the third estate said, no, if each of you have 300 apiece, we should have 600. Well, the king says, you know what? Please stop this bickering. I need the estates general to come together because I have a problem and you guys are going to have to fix it. And so he says, first estate gets 300, second estate gets 300, third estate, you get 600. We're meeting. Get your delegates in order and get them to the meeting of the estates general. We are meeting here at Versailles. So this was a little hee 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 for the third estates. Like, yes, we get our 600 votes or our 600 representatives. And you know what? We're going to try to make a few changes in this meeting so that that 600 works in our favor. So now we're at the meeting. And this meeting, it's a disaster from the moment they get there. I mean, the first and second estate demand that the third estate have to stand throughout the meeting so that they realize that they are not their equals. Um, third estate delegates won't be allowed into a room until the other two estates have already entered and have seated. So they're playing these little games back and forth with each other. And then as they are all in the meeting, they are sitting for hours listening to Louis's finance minister go on and on and on about this massive debt and financial collapse that France is on the verge of. They are shocked. Here they sit with their list of grievances, and it's not even a concern for the king. And on top of that, he just unloaded this bomb upon them. We're in a debt. We are on the verge of collapse. And now he's telling us to fix his mess. This was a sham. They were furious that he did this to them. Now we have another problem. How are we going to vote? And the estates are going back and forth and they're arguing back and forth and back and forth over the voting system. Well, the third estate is saying we need to vote by head. Each representative will receive one vote. And the first two estates are saying, no, we need to continue to vote by order. Each estate gets one vote. Well, that's not going to be fair, according to the third estate. Because if each estate votes by order, the first two estates always vote together. So it will always go two to one. And if Louis is really thinking about this, he really needs them to vote by head. Because that third estate would definitely tax the second estate. And all they would need to do is sway one vote their way. Go to that first estate. Get one of those clergymen who's a little upset and disgruntled with that second estate and get them to switch over. They would be able to get anything they wanted that way. So Louis decides he knows how they can settle this dispute. We are going to vote on how... To vote. And we're going to use the voting system that they used the last time the Estates General met, which was 175 years ago. And that voting system was to vote by order. Okay, this man really should have stopped and thought about this. He is giving them the go ahead to vote by order, which means the first two estates are going to say, we vote against voting by head. We support voting by order, which means we're going to continue to vote by order. Each estate gets one vote, and he's never going to get his tax on the second estate. 
But like I mentioned earlier under the causes, he is not a competent ruler. So they vote by order on whether or not to change the voting system. And uh, voting by order wins out two to one. First two estates say we will continue to vote by order. Third estate with their one vote, vote by head. So now we will continue voting by order. Louis the 16th needed someone to like flick him in his arm and say, what were you thinking? What he wasn't, he was not thinking at all here. So now we're going to end up with the tennis court oath. And there's a few things that take place between voting on the voting system and leading up to the tennis court oath and the third estate getting locked out of the meeting room. So unfortunately for the royal family, um, a tragedy strikes and one of their children uh, passes away. And so Louis and Marie, who, you know, understandably are devastated by this event, have removed themselves from the meeting. And while they are in mourning, the third estate starts to get a little antsy and they start to send him notes, you know, yeah, you know. We are very sorry for the loss, um, our heart's with you, but we really need for you to come back because they are not getting along with the other two estates. They're back and forth, back and forth, the three of them. Well, they really should have like gave them a little bit more time of mourning and they really probably should have been a little bit better, a little more diplomatic in the letter they sent him because he was mad. And instead of coming back, he sends his wife and Marie Antoinette is going to side with the nobles. So the second estate is like, yes, we have someone on our side. Well, they continue going back and forth and back and forth. And then one day the third estate shows up and they can't even get into the meeting room. They've been locked out. They're being excluded. So they head to the tennis courts. They get into the tennis courts and there are members of the first estate who join with them because they don't agree with them being locked out and not being included in the discussion and then the debates that was going on. And it's here on the tennis court that the estates, that the National Assembly will be formed. And this third, these third estate representatives and some members of the first estate Take what is known as the tennis court oath. And that tennis court oath says we swear never to separate ourselves from the National Assembly and to reassemble wherever circumstances require until the constitution of the realm is drawn up and fixed upon solid foundations. They have agreed to stay together until a new constitution has been written for France and that the change in government has taken place. They're not working with the Estates General now. They are a national assembly and that is the governing body that they plan on working with. Now, with this national assembly, it is under the direction of a clergyman, CAs the representative of the tennis court, that they would be that national assembly. So as we see, there were members of the first estate who did come in and supported them and even worked to create this national assembly. This was a major, this was their first major victory for that third estate. Louis XVI recognizes the national assembly as a governing body to be one that they have to work with. He will tell the first two estates, get down to the tennis courts and you are going to work with them. This was a smart move on his part. You're going to work with them because all of this bickering that's been going on, have they dealt with the financial crisis in France? No, they have not. The only thing they have dealt with was how many delegates each representative gets to have, um, how are they going to vote, arguing with each other, offending the king during a time of tragedy and his wife and the family, locking one group out, and now creating a national assembly where they say this governing body represents the people. And the king says, 
get down to the tennis court and you are going to work with the National Assembly. Smart move. So Louis the Sixteenth does have some, but then he counters it, and that's where we're going to go. Then is not so smart move. You know, he wanted to make sure that everyone saw that he was still king and in charge. So he brings with him mercenary troops, just in case the National Assembly, those third estate representatives become a little aggressive, and he wants to flex some muscle. So they surround the tennis court. Now, remember, those list of grievances that the estates brought with them were representative of all the different classes of people. So while all of this has been taking place in Versailles with this meeting of the estates general, you have had third estate members who aren't delegates from like the working class and even some of the peasants who have been hanging outside the gate waiting to hear what's happening. Well, the fact that they had created that National Assembly, that was a moment to cheer. And then that the king forced the other two estates to go down and work with him, another moment to cheer. But what do you mean he's bringing troops? He's bringing troops and they're surrounding the National Assembly? Why is he doing that? They're a little worried. They're worried that he's going to do something to the National Assembly. The National Assembly represents them, the people. So how are they going to react? They're fearful. And they believe that they need to protect the National Assembly. And if the king is going to bring in troops to surround them, then it sounds like they may need to get some weapons of their own. And they storm the Bastille. July 14th, 1789. There are stars around this. Because yes, this date will find you again. So why the Bastille? <clears throat> well, the Bastille is a prison. It was used as a prison. Um, so for the people, particularly that third estate, the Bastille was nothing but a symbol of oppression for them and a den of torture. So if you would get locked away for 40 years, this is where you would go. And this was something that they wanted removed. But they also knew that it was a place that was now being used to house gunpowder and weapons. So if you needed gunpowder and weapons to protect the National Assembly, then that's where you're headed. You're running right into that Bastille, this former prison, this symbol of oppression and den of torture, and you're going to get your gunpowder and you're gonna get your weapons. And this is men and women. So when we look at this French Revolution, it is men and women fighting side by side. It, they are storming the Bastille. And when they go into the Bastille, they are murdering the guards. They are going to tear this symbol of oppression down brick by brick using their hands. They want it gone. And they want the gunpowder and the weapons to help them in order to fight the mercenaries if they attack the National Assembly. But what's going on in the countryside? So that stuff's taking place right there at Versailles and then going into Bastille in order to protect the National Assembly because rumors are starting to spread. They're hearing that the nobles are going to hire outlaws to attack the peasants. Well, my goodness, they're going to shut down the National Assembly. They're going to come after the peasants. They're after the third estate. Well, the peasants decide they're going to strike first. So they destroy the nobles' homes. They set things on fire. They burn down these buildings that are on the estates. And they make sure that all legal notes, all documentation of taxes that they owed, any additional money that the nobles say they owe them, they destroy that. Because, hey, if this thing does not go in the direction that the third estate wants, then at least we can eliminate all of the stuff that says how much we owe the nobles. And then there's no record of it. So then... I'm not paying for that. So as we move through this French Revolution, we're seeing that in a very short time, what started out as let's come together as the Estates General and try to deal with the issues in our nation has now escalated to tearing down an old prison brick by brick, killing off the guards, 
gathering weapons in order to fight mercenary troops that belong to the king in order to protect the National Assembly. So the people are seeing small steps of victory, and then it seems like they're being slapped in the face with the king still in charge, the nobles are coming after them. And again, this great fear, it was rumors, rumors from both sides, but the peasants will strike first, and they're going to make sure that they are able to stop whatever is coming their way. And we're not even in the bloodiest part of this revolution. There will be more to come when we get into section two. All right, so that is going to wrap up our French Revolution notes. So something to think about. What's this National Assembly going to do next? What changes are they going to make? Because they're going to make a lot. Are they going to make enough changes that actually benefit all of the French people, or are they going to be very selective? We'll just have to wait and see.